Welcome. It's amazing that over 2,700 doctors of veterinary medicine registered for today's event. We're just thrilled to see so many of you here today. You're among colleagues from all corners of the world, from Europe, Africa, the Americas, Oceania, and Asia. Some of you are joining us at the end of your day, and so good evening, and some of you in the wee morning hours, and so good morning. Welcome to our webinar on practical small animal ultrasound, diagnosing pathology with intestinal, gallbladder, and spleen exams. The popularity of point of care ultrasound has grown dramatically in veterinary medicine for its ability to support rapid and accurate diagnosis. Demand for educational and training has grown in kind. Shortly, we'll introduce you to today's expert ultrasonography educator, the fabulous Dr. Camilla Edwards. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce you to your host. Dr. Oran Frankel is trained in emergency medicine in California. A passionate POCUS educator, Dr. Frankel has been using point of care ultrasound his entire career. He now practices in a busy academic teaching hospital in Vancouver as an emergency physician. When he's not busy saving lives, Dr. Frankel serves as the chairman of our Claris Medical Advisory Board, helping to deliver educational content like our webinar today. Dr. Frankel, welcome and over to you. Thanks so much, Janez. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, today, we're here to talk about veterinary POCUS, uh, point of care ultrasound, a little outside of my normal expertise, and I'm so glad that Dr. Edwards is here. A bit quick of an introduction. I wanted to start, you know, the American College of Veterinary Radiology states the obvious, but it's worth noting that veterinarians who perform ultrasound examinations should know the anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology of the areas. And we're going to get to that today on various conditions that can be treated with point of care and diagnosed with point of care ultrasound. I wanted to also bring attention to a survey in recent practice um, that was, this was United States specific, but it crossed the span of a lot of different practices. And it showed that 53% of practices already had ultrasound in their practice. And I was quite surprised to see that finding. Um, and that 45% reported having done over five scans a week. And so the majority of the veterinarians that responded, at least in this US survey, said that they felt that it facilitated accurate and timely diagnosis. And they were using ultrasound in-house. And then the most common reasons for not having an ultrasound were cited as prohibitive costs and lack of training. So before we kind of dive deeper into these challenges, I wanted to kind of pose a, a couple polls to our audience uh, spread internationally. And we don't know what the practice surveys are for everyone. Uh, we have two different polls for the two separate camps. Who has ultrasound in their practice in-house and who does it? So, and this, I think this will help inform the rest of our webinar. So for the first group, for those of you who do not offer ultrasound in-house, we wanna know kind of what are the reasons preventing you and feel free to answer all of the above. Is it that the machines have historically been too expensive? or they have too many knobs, too many buttons, and it's too complex to use. It's something we hear a lot in the human world. Do you not have the sonography experience in-house in your practice uh, to be able to use the machine? And so even if you had the expense, it just sits there. Have you experienced a lack of training options and ability to learn how to use the devices? Or do you feel like you don't need to offer ultrasound? Uh, in which case I wonder, I think that probably doesn't apply to most of the people in this webinar. Or are there some other reasons that may be holding you back that we'd love to hear more about in the future? So we'll go ahead and give this a couple seconds here. And then we will close out the poll. Great. And so you can see, I guess the majority is that they don't have experience in-house. And you can see that people have cited, uh, like uh, that we've experienced in the med human medicine, they're expensive. There's lack of training options. And as I expected, people don't feel like they don't have to offer. That's good. So we're appreciating the standards here. You know, for those who do have ultrasound, I want you to maybe speak to, if you can share quickly, uh, for those who don't have it, what do you see as the key advantages? Have you experienced that you can nail the diagnosis on the first visit uh, of a client and their patient? Have you noticed improved diagnostic accuracy in your clinic? Do you feel then as a result that you can start your treatment plan sooner? Uh, and have you experienced any increased revenue that is generated having ultrasound in your practice? Or have you noticed that you're getting increased referrals from the community to people who have heard that you have the ultrasound in your house? Let's give it a second. Okay, we'll close out that poll. So for those who have it practiced, yep. As, as we expect, you know, improved diagnostic accuracy is number one on everybody's list and getting it on the first visit, starting the treatment plan sooner, and then even some kind of fallout of the revenue and referral service. So that's great. 
So you can see that, you know, even for those who are in the webinar, we're not just pulling it from the literature. And before we dive into the meat of this webinar, I wanted to kind of circle to a question that we see keeps coming back up in the point of care ultrasound world. As it becomes cheaper, um, more, uh, more portable and app-based in the smartphones that all of us are carrying, we're finding that this question comes up over and over again. When and how is ultrasound becoming the standard of care? And I wanted to just bring, uh, there's a great survey, uh, a review article from 2015 that highlights kind of the current state of practice. And the highlights from this article were that ultrasound in veterinary medicine is increasing in popularity year over year. And the use in small animal vet medicine has a history dating back as long as we've seen it in humans. And the clinical indications are basically the same. Uh, but you know, just like in humans, ultrasound is fast, non-invasive, and can really further your diagnostic and therapeutic capabilities. Uh, but you know, what we've also experienced in the human world is as these technologies are spreading into the clinic, what we're finding is it opens up a vast world where practitioners realize that ultrasound can basically be used to scan every organ system in the body. And so how do we make sense of this wide new world of applications and modifications to your clinical practice? Suddenly, you know, your, the most common indication for veterinary medicine from this uh, review article, at least of what we've heard, is it's chronically elevated liver enzymes. But once the probe is in the hand of those who know how to use it, suddenly all these different organ systems are amenable to diagnostic studies, and it can really open up a world and can be overwhelming uh, and where to point your, your probe. So that's why we're so happy to have Dr. Edwards here today, who's our expert guest speaker. Dr. Camilla Edwards is a DVM who graduated from KVL in Copenhagen in 2006. She worked in general practice and emergency critical care in the UK. She achieved her certificate in advanced veterinary practice in 2018. She started her company First Opinion Veterinary Ultrasound in 2018, where she scans for general practices in the UK. She reviews ultrasound machines, teaches ultrasound, and runs a Facebook community with 2,000 vets, who many of you may be already a part of, who are interested in ultrasound. We're so glad to have Dr. Edwards here to help us explore the clinical approaches to veterinary ultrasound that could be used on your next day at work. So Dr. Edwards, over to you. Thank you very much, Oren, for that wonderful introduction. Um, so I'm really delighted to be here today to talk to you about uh, the gallbladder, spleen and intestines. And we're gonna look at how to scan uh, in dogs and cats. And we'll look at a little bit of pathology as well. So what are we gonna learn in this webinar? We're gonna look at gallbladder, spleen and intestines, how to scan these areas, what measurements are necessary to take um, to really understand what we're seeing. And we'll look at some examples of pathology. We are assuming a little bit of knowledge. We're assuming you've got some basic knowledge about ultrasound machine setup and also about some common ultrasound artifacts. We'll start with the gallbladder. So as Oren said, anatomy is key. You really need to know your anatomy when you're picking up that ultrasound scanner. Um, so with regards to the gallbladder, it's a fluid filled organ, which will appear black on the screen, on the ultrasound screen. Um, in dogs, the gallbladder sits between the quadrate and the right medial liver lobes. And in the cat, it sits between two parts of the right medial liver lobe. Um, and its job is it stores and it concentrates bile received from the hepatic biliary ducts. So the indications for scanning the gallbladder uh, would be increased liver values, uh, increased total bilirubin. If we've got some cranial abdominal pain, um, we often think of pancreatitis, but we should also include um, gallbladder disease on our differential diagnosis list. And um, we can use it in the assessment of anaphylaxis if we see the halo sign. Some common artifacts we see uh, when we're scanning the gallbladder include the slice th thickness artifact where the ultrasound machine um, averages out what it's seeing uh, between the wall and the uh, content of the gallbladder and, and makes it almost appear like there's sludge within the gallbladder, but that can be an artifact. We'll see acoustic enhancement as the sound waves pass through the fluid, they're not attenuated, so beyond the gallbladder will appear brighter. And we can see ultrasound um, waves bounced off the corners of the rounded surface of the gallbladder with refraction. And we'll see mirror image artifacts. So here we can see the diaphragm and we've got the liver here and then we've got the gallbladder. 
And because there's gas in the, in the lungs, then we've got uh, lots of sound waves bouncing around and we end up with a mirror image on the opposite side. And that tells us that the lungs are nicely full of gas. So here's some normal views of the gallbladder. This is a sagittal view up the top here. We've got the nice mirror image um, of both the liver and the gallbladder here. Um, we like to get a transverse view as well. The view at the bottom is, is fanning through the liver and the gallbladder. So we can see uh, the stomach just pops into view as well, cordially. Um, so we need to remember that the gallbladder lies right of the midline. So when we put, place the probe on uh, sagittally, we won't necessarily see it. We'll need to aim the probe slightly to the right of midline. Cats have this quirk that they can have bilobed gallbladders and that can be completely normal. The gallbladder size varies depending on the length of time since the last meal. So often we'll be scanning starved animals. So they have a fairly large gallbladder. We expect the content to be anechoic, so black, um, because it's fluid. And we, in these cases, we can see the, the gallbladder wall is really thin, but if we were to measure, uh, we'd expect it to be under 0.1 centimetres in cats and under 0.2 centimetres in dogs. So now we're going to have a look at a video about how to scan the gallbladder. In the human population, we can tell how long people have been fasting in the waiting room by how big their gallbladder is. It's kind of a yeah. same thing in the animals too. <laughs> totally, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So here's my dog Pippi. Um, I'm placing the probe um, just behind the Ziffy sternum and aiming quite cranially. Um, so we can rock the probe to get an even further cranial view. So we've got to get that top corner of the uh, liver in view. Then we fan all the way through. Then we rock the probe caudally. So we can see this caudal border of the liver and we fan all the way through there. So we've seen both sides, the caudal side of the liver, and then we rotate the probe 90 degrees, and then we fan all the way through the liver again. And we can see the gallbladder there nicely on the right-hand side. I'm just highlighting it there, doing that with my finger on the screen. And they're highlighting the diaphragm, which is much more horizontal in the transverse view. So fanning all the way through. And then we've seen the gallbladder in two different planes, sagittal and transverse. If we scan fan up in the sagittal view, um, we can see any gas that rises in the gallbladder. Um, and if we fan down, we can see any sludge or sediment, um, any mineral mineralization that falls and is gravity dependent. And for beginning ultrasound, uh, beginning sonographers, you know, our basic lesson is anything that's fluid filled is black, right? So the gallbladder should be exactly. fluid filled. You're looking for the big black structure. The stomach will have gaseous contents, other things that are shadowing out, right? Exactly, exactly. So yeah, fluid is black. Um, and that's what we're seeing in that nice normal gallbladder that my dog thankfully has. Um, <laughs> some common pathology we might see, obviously we talked about that uh, gallbladder might be large because the, the animal's been starved, but it can also be large from because there's obstructive disease going on. And we need to work out whether that's intrahepatic, extrahepatic, whether that's, um, you know, so, something stuck in the, in the lumen of the bile, bile ducts. Um, we also look at the margins. Uh, so we have a look for wall edema uh, or increased thickness. Um, so we expect it to be under 0.2 millimeters in uh, centimeters in dogs. And, and um, we also look for some, if there's any free fluid, because that can um, tell us if there's been a gallbladder rupture, which is extremely serious um, for, for the animal. With regards to the echogenicity, we look at the, the contents of the lumen of the gallbladder. As Oren said, we, it should be black and anechoic. Um, if it's fluid, um, but we can get sludge and we need to classify that. Is it mobile or non-mobile? Is it shadowing or non-shadowing? And we can also get other diseases such as polyps, mucosils and coleoliths. And once we have seen some pathology, it's important to talk about its distribution. Is it 
just in one area as focal or is it diffusely throughout the gallbladder? So here we're looking at a video of a uh, a liver with a gallbladder with some sludge in it. Um, so this is a sagittal view. We've got the diaphragm is this bright white line here and we're fanning through. Occasionally we can see the, the beating heart over here um, through, through the diaphragm. And we're fanning up towards the left and then we'll fan down towards the right. And here we've got the, the gallbladder coming into view and we just see some sludge. We'll have a look on the next video. So here we can see again, the gallbladder and there we go. There's some hyperechoic sludge and it's all falling to, to one side. So that is falling to the gravity dependent side. Um, and if we were to flip the dog over, um, we would see after a few minutes that it's, it's falling to the other side. Kind of like a snow globe, is that what you would kind call it? Kind of like it? a snow globe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and here again, we've just got a transverse view. So we've got the horizontal, more horizontal diaphragm there and the gallbladder here with a small amount of sludge in. So gallbladder sludge is not always significant. So we need to weigh things up. Um, it, ultrasound is part of the um, concluding and diagnosing in these cases. It can be normal in elderly dogs to find sludge. Um, so we really need to weigh things up whether we think it's abnormal or not. In cats, it's always abnormal. So if we find sludge, we know something's going on there in the gallbladder. Um, we can see uh, tortuous bile ducts uh, if if the bile is, is struggling to get through the bile ducts, they can become tortuous. Um, but that can also be normal in cats, um, but is definitely abnormal in dogs. We can also see mineralization. We'll see this by um, the, the sludge might be quite, quite bright, like almost white, and then we'll have an acoustic shadow. So we can't really see through it. And it, there may even be stones. Um, we need to assess the mobility of the sludge. Is it able to move from one side to another? And do we have an intraluminal or extraluminal obstruction? Is there any gallbladder wall thickening? That can help uh, us to believe that there might be a, a cholangitis um, going on. So ultrasound is an essential tool with regards to assessing sludge. Um, it adds evidence to bloods and the history, uh, how the animal is doing. And it's a really useful tool in these cases uh, to use for serial scans. Uh, we can monitor treatment. Often uh, if they are um, poorly with choliangitis, then they might need uh, multiple scans over a period of months um, to assess when, when treatment can be stopped. Um, also to assess for disease progression, because sometimes we see an abnormal collection of mucus and bile salts, which can lead to a biliary mucosal. And these are really serious and can be become a surgical emergency because they can lead to obstruction, necrosis and gallbladder rupture. So that was a little bit about the gallbladder. We'll move on to the spleen now. So splenic anatomy, we've got an elongated flattened organ, which is triangular in cross section in dogs and ovoid in cats. It's located uh, near the stomach on the left hand side and it goes under the rib cage cranially. So um, the dorsal head close to the stomach is, is really fixed in position, but the tail ventrally is very mobile and it can uh, point down towards the urinary bladder or down ventrally. So really have to find out in that individual animal where it is headed. So some indications for scanning the spleen that we'll see in general practice uh, would include if we saw uh, cranial ab abdominal organ organomegaly or if we had a hemoperitoneum. Uh, the classic will be uh, lethargic pale dog with an enlarged abdomen coming in. Uh, we stick the probe on and we'll see some fluid 
we need to have a look at the spleen to, to assess whether, whether we've got a bleeding hemangiosarcoma on the spleen. So here are some normal views of the spleen. Um, so we, we've got the splenic head um, underneath the rib cage here. We've got the stomach cranially, and then we'll have the left kidney up here. And then we aim the probe under the rib cage. Then we can move down to the, the splenic body. We can see in this video um, and we move here. We've got the hillus where we've got the blood vessels entering the spleen. And then we follow it all the way down to the tail. It's really important to follow it and look at the tail and, and the head because there can be a nodule or a mass right on the tip. We should see a uniform homogenous organ and in dogs, uh, it can vary enormously in size, but in cats, it should never be more than one centimeter thick at the hillus uh, where the blood vessels enter. Um, and it should never be folded. If, if these are your findings, then you've got an enlarged spleen. So we'll have a look at how to scan the spleen. When do you use the ultrasound if you find fluid in the belly? Do you use the ultrasound to guide, you know, checking the fluid or getting a sample, like to, to determine if it's blood or what it is? Yeah, yeah, because we don't want to hit a, a, a blood vessel um, if we can avoid it, and also intestines. So ultrasound guided something is is a really useful tool uh, and makes things a lot safer than than blind blind sticking a needle in. So we'll look at this video of how to scan the spleen. So we start um, in the same position for the liver, the ziffy sternum, and then we follow the costal arch um, up. We'll the first organ we'll come across after the liver is the stomach. Um, we can see some stomach here and we can see some spleen at the top here. And we get the left kidney just coming into view and we fan underneath the rib cage and you can see all of this spleen that we wouldn't otherwise see, um, which is under the rib cage. Um, you can't get to palpate that. Ultrasound is really um, a brilliant way of having a look under there. Um, and it's important because it's a big chunk of the spleen not to forget to look under there. So once we've fanned the head of the spleen, uh, we will lift the probe up and uh, rotate it. So we're aiming longitudinally down, um, the, we're taking the direction of the spleen. And sometimes that can be a little bit difficult to figure out and we'll make, need to make small adjustments. But the principle is to slide and fan, slide and fan, slide and fan until we've got to the tail of the spleen. Sometimes that involves um, going round to the other side of the body. And um, it, it, in Pippi, my dog's case, I'd been scanning her for quite a while at this point, and the spleen grows with massage. So um, hers had grown quite a lot and I needed to extend round, round to the other side of the abdomen to get to the tail that we can see there. Then we turn, rotate the probe again, 90 degrees and bring, bring it all the way back up the spleen. So there, then we've seen the whole spleen in two different um, directions, transverse and longitudinal. Is your dog permanently shaved? Yeah. She's yeah. Permanently <laughs> shaved. <Poor dog>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's, uh, yeah, permanently shaved. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, it's You're going to show me uh, how to do a scan in a bit, and uh, we yeah. show a different tip on how to get around the shaving if it's, uh, yeah. if you really have to. Yeah. Yeah, I will do. <laughs> right. So some common pathology we see in the spleen. Um, so like I said, in dogs, the, the size really varies a lot. We can't, um, we can't just off, off from ultrasound say this dog's got an enlarged spleen um, because it really can, can grow and, and get small. But pa pathological causes uh, can include um, co congestion and sedation or lymphoid hyperplasia extramedullary hematopoiesis, infiltrative disease, and splenic torsion. We need to take a close look at the margins, whether they're regular or irregular. Um, we're looking for nodules and, and masses. 
Um, often when we see a hyperechoic nodule, we'll, it's, it's often a myelolipoma, so a fatty benign structure, um, but we really can't tell without sampling for sure. Um, so we, we might find hypoechoic nodules or mixed echogenicity, and we need to look at their distribution. There are a few um, things that are quite characteristic that we might find on ultrasound. So one of them is a, a lacy spleen, uh, where we see sort of uh, hypoechoic, so darker sort of hacks in the spleen, and this can indicate a splenic torsion, which is a, a real emergency. Um, the other one that we might see is, is a Swiss cheese spleen where there are, are hypoechoic holes in the spleen and this is commonly seen with lymphoma. And again, we, we think about the distribution of the pathology. So here we've got um, a, a pathology that we've, we've found. We've got the split, splenic head here, which looks uh, quite normal, but here we've found a a mixed echogenicity mass, um, unfortunately, in, in, this, in this beagle. So what could it be? Um, well, this is a table of, of different thing, different diagnoses that we might have for different types of lesions in the spleen. Um, but as you can see, there's, there's a lot of differentials for each one. And, and really to diagnose, we need to get a sample. Um, it, it becomes more obvious if, if there's also bleeding, then we are more worried about hemangiosarcoma. But in this case, we'll be looking at the masses and the mixed echogenicity um, to narrow down what we think this might be in this case. Um, it did turn out to be a hemangiosarcoma in this case. Moving on to the intestines. So, Again, with, with regards to anatomy in the intestines, um, we're, we're focusing a bit smaller. We're, we're looking at the wall layering in the gastrointestinal tract, which can be quite important. So here we've got one loop of small intestine. And the first layer we've got is this thin white line that's called the serosa. The next hypoechoic line is the muscularis, followed by the hyperechoic submucosa and then this thicker mucosa which is hypoechoic and then in the middle we've got the lumen and that can be fi filled with gas uh, if it is filled with gas we won't see all of the other side of the wall it will just obstruct that view um, it can obviously be filled with ingester and it's always wise to figure out what the animal what the animal's diet is because if if they're raw fed or if they're kibble fed um, that will give quite different images um, you might find fluid or mucus like this or if we get down to the colon then you'll find feces and these repeat on the other side and i think it's worth pointing out those are really you know sub millimeter structures some of them right the really yeah. thin lines and how important it is to have yeah here you go uh, like yeah. high high resolution uh, exactly. to really be able to identify all those different layers. Exactly. So, yeah, when we're talking about measurements, um, yeah, we, we are talking down at the 0.22 centimetres for, for cats. And, um, and, you know, that's composed of, of quite a few layers. So when we're looking for um, changes within the layers, so sometimes the muscularis layer might be thickened, for example, in cats with IBD, then that's, um, you know, that's quite a small thing that we're, we're noticing a difference in, absolutely. So we've got, um, normally we've got this, this layering that, that, that's different in the different parts of the intestine. So the duodenum has a thicker mucosa than the rest. Uh, jejunum has a reasonably thick mucosa, but not as thick as the du duodenum. And the ileum has a equal thickness muscularis submucosa and mucosal layers. The colon can be difficult to differentiate the layers as it is so thin. We're talking 0.15 centimeters. And in, in dogs, um, it does vary um, as well, but we're expecting a bit of a thicker duodenum than the rest of the intestines. And we should see peristalsis um, one to three times a minute in the intestines normally, but um, often we'll see these animals sedated and, and 
then it's, it's much less than that. Here are some normal images. So we've got the duodenum here, we've got the lumen and the thick mucosa we can see here, um, compared to the jejunum, and, and these are both in my dog Pippi. Um, so we can see that this mucosal layer is slightly thinner than, than in the duodenum. Here we've got uh, the ileum, and we can see the layers are much, much more evenly uh, spread. And the transverse colon, we can, we can just about make out because we can see the gas and the, and the feces obstructing the view, but we've got such a thin wall that we can't really differentiate uh, the, the wall layers in that. So indications for scanning the uh, intestines include obviously vomiting, chronic diarrhea, and abdo abdominal pain. Common artifacts, uh, acoustic shadowing, gas is our enemy in, in the intestines and we'll often only see one side of the intestinal wall because gas will obscure the other side. And that's why I like to scan from both sides of the animal. Um, in transverse view, we'll might get refraction off the curved surface. So we'll have a look at the video of how to scan the intestines. Camilla, in my literature review for this webinar, um, I found a paper, we didn't review it, but uh, it, it talked about using it for foreign body identification and how much better ultrasound was than radiography and that it enabled pulling out, identifying and pulling, you know, retrieving the foreign bodies quite readily. Um, how often do you find foreign bodies and what do they usually look like? Um, so they are usually, um, perfectly shaped. That's, um, that's one of the things that gives them away. So you're never going to find a perfect circle in the abdomen. Normally it's a ball. If you find something, <laughs> um, they're often hyperechoic and they often have an acoustic shadow as well. Um, so yeah, ultrasound can definitely pick it, pick up, um, foreign bodies. Yeah. That's, that's definitely true. So We'll start on uh, the left-hand side. So Pippi's in right lateral recumbency. And I start up by the left kidney. Um, we can see that on the screen here. And what I like to do is do a castle pattern, much like we're taught to do on microscope slides. We take a systematic view of the whole intestines because we can't simply, simply can't follow it from one end to the other. Um, it's too complicated in there. So um, we scan down ventrally and then move caudally and then move dorsally and continue that pattern. And we're just observing as we go, we're looking at loops of intestine and we're looking out for anything that appears thickened or if the wall layering appears different, then we'll stop and have a look at that and measure it. Um, and even during a normal scan, I'll tend to stop a few times and measure um, just a few loops of intestine just to check that there's not some diffuse change that I'm not noticing because it all looks the same. So then when I get back to the bladder, I stop um, looking at the small intestine. So then I've, I've covered the whole of the jejunum there. So I'm having a look back um, at, at at a loop of intestine just to show what how I would measure. So I've got a longitudinal loop of, of uh, jejunum here and I'm measuring from just inside the, the lumen to just inside the serosa. Um, ultrasound can overestimate the thickness of serosa so we don't include that. Um, and that's just done by pressing on the screen. Um, so I'm looking for the colon now. So I'm looking through the, through the bladder up towards the spine. Uh, and we're going to get a longitudinal view. Here we can see the gas in the colon. I'm highlighting that now, but I think I'm going to highlight that as well <laughs> on, the, on the video. Um, so that's, that's the longitudinal view. And if we rotate, we get a more circular view of the colon with its acoustic shadow we can see below. So also we can look at the colon a bit more closely rather than through the, the bladder. We can follow it um, from its dorsal position, dorsal caudal posi position, follow it cranially um, to where it, the descending colon becomes the transverse colon. So here um, I'm just gonna flip Pippi over. We get to see her face now. <laughs> She's used to this, huh? She doesn't require any yeah. sedation anymore. 
<laughs> she's never never had sedation for it. <laughs> she's, she's pretty good because she's still still a puppy at heart. So, um, yeah. So now we've got her in left lateral recumbency. So this is where we can get a view of the duodenum. We start at the right kidney. There we can see the right kidney. And then we slide ventrally. And the first uh, loop of in small intestine that comes into view, there we can see at the top, is the duodenum. It's very long and straight. Um, that helps us to identify it. It's the most dorsal uh, loop of intestine on the, on the right hand side, and it's really superficial. You can see how close it is to the probe here. Um, so there we go, and following it cordially to the caudal flexure, and then we're following it cranially, and we'll get down to the pyloroduodenal junction. And we're taking a little transverse view of it here as well. So we've got a circular view of it, and that's a really good view for the pancreas as well. So now I'm repeating the castle pattern on, on this right-hand side of, of uh, Pippi's abdomen. It's always good to uh, take two views, just like we do with radiography, take two views um, of the same structure uh, because then hopefully we won't miss things. Um, so again, we're just doing the castle pattern. So sliding ventrally, sliding a little bit cordially and then dorsally until we get back to the bladder. So when we're scanning like this, uh, we may come across the ascending colon um, or, the, or the ilium. Um, the ilium is, is very short, so um, it's, it's not always, uh, always found, easily found uh, because gas can often obstruct it as well. So we, we, we have a look while we're, we're scanning on that side, that's where we'll find it, where, where the ascending colon is. So some common pathology we'll see in the intestines. We'll look out for uh, dilation. That can indicate an obstruction further along. We're looking for increased wall thickness uh, and uh, interception, which is something that ultrasound is, is brilliant at picking up. Um, and and you'll, you'll get a diagnosis of that by seeing basically a loop of intestine within another loop of intestine. Um, we're look, looking for focal masses uh, and also need to consider movement in the intestines. So is there decreased motility? Uh, even if the, animals, if the animal's not sedated, then that might be uh, for pathological reasons, uh, or is there even increased motility? And with regards to echogenicity, we're looking for changes in wall layering and we're looking for lumen content, just as we were talking about, Aram. And then, as always, we need to think about the distribution. Is it diffuse, focal or multifocal? So here we've got the uh, intestinal mass that was palpated um, in a cat that was vomiting. So we can see here, we've got some normal uh, intestines there cranially, and then it's um, the, we can see the lumen coming across here. And we've got this thick wall on either side, which is, um, also has no discernible wall layering that we can see. And this is just a, a, a scan through uh, one side of the mass where the, the lumen comes in into view there as well. So this is um, quite a focal lesion in this cat. And differentials for this presentation might include uh, some localized inflammation, edema, uh, but we've really got to consider high up on our list is lymphoma. And it would be really nice to see uh, the local lymph nodes uh, if they're in affected in any way. So what are the take home messages today? Well, we've had a look at how to scan the gallbladder, spleen and intestines. And with the gallbladder, we need to remember it's in the mid right liver. So if you can't find it, aim, aim towards the right. With regards to the spleen, we must remember to look under the rib cage. Don't forget that splenic head. It, it's a big part of the organ. Also with regards to the tail, 
don't apply too much pressure because it's so mobile. If you apply pressure, it can disappear. With the intestines, we need to systematically view the whole area from two different planes. Measurements and observations we can make in these organs include gallbladder wall thickness and also its luminal content. With the spleen, we can measure the hillus in cats. It needs to be under one centimeter. And with the intestines, we need to look at the total thickness of the wall and the layering is it appropriate for that part of the intestines. And some pathology to watch out for that we've learned about today. The gallbladder, we saw some sludge. Uh, it's usually hyperechoic. And, we, and in this case, it was falling to the dependent side. It was quite mobile. Um, with the, the spleen, watch out for, for tumors. And we saw a mixed echogenicity tumor that turned out to be a hemangiosarcoma. And with intestines, we need to think about the wall layering. Um, is it there? Is it altered in any way? And the whole wall itself, is it increased in thickness? So thank you so much for listening uh, to my webinar, um, my lecture. Um, please do get in touch with any questions for me. Uh, you can get hold of me at camilla at fovu.co.uk and check out my website, fovu.co.uk, um, where you can find out about uh, me scanning for different practices in the UK. I review ultrasound machines, so you can find out more about different machines, including the Clarius I've reviewed. Um, I also run online courses, so uh, that are four weeks long. One's just started. There's a few spaces left, started on Monday. Um, and then join the Facebook community. Um, you can find out more at my website, fovu.co.uk. Thanks so much, Camilla. Yeah, and we're gonna do a quick live demo. I, I am not an expert at scanning animals. Um, I, I do know how to scan humans, but I've never really done animals. So we have Max here. We yeah. already kind of, I'm following the C1 do one edict. So I watched your video on yeah. how to do a gallbladder ultrasound and we have Max laying down, he's not shaved. Um, I heard yeah. from you, I can use some alcohol and I'm yeah. gonna find, where, where, where's my landmark here? So your sternum, so the end of the sternum, siffy sternum. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Right so, there, okay. So yeah. I'm gonna just put some alcohol so on. The, um, we often do this with um, sort of AFAST and TFAST scans. We don't, don't shave for those. So we apply liberally with alcohol and then liberally with gel as well. Um, and often that gives, gives a good enough image. Um, if we're looking for, for liver pathology, we'd probably want to, to clip so we get the best image. Right, we to can. get a whole window here. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So um, um, I'm gonna try here. So I've got the probe. And so I found the zippy sternum, right? So yeah. I, and um, from the video, it looks like I kind of aim up into the chest. Is that right? Yeah, so if you can okay. aim even more cranially and rock it further cranially. Uh, okay, yeah, cranial, great. okay, great. And so I think, what is this, the diaphragm right here that I'm seeing? Yeah, yeah you can see that, exactly. So that's the okay. diaphragm. It's, yeah, um, yeah um, it, that, that, that's obviously cranial to the, to the liver. Quarterly, you can yeah. just about make out the stomach as well. That's the stomach um, with all the gas that's showing? Yeah, right. exactly. Okay. So there's great. gas in that. And from here, um, where am I gonna go? So if you fan um, towards the table, oh, so if you fan go. towards the right, um, yeah. then- Is that gallbladder right there? Gallbladder in view, oh, yes. Oh my gosh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Brilliant. we're we're seeing nice thin wall here. I mean, I'm using exactly. my human interpretation skills, but nice thin yeah. wall. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any sludge. No. Make sure you go all the way through the gallbladder. Um, right, so all the way through, yeah. Scanned all the way through to the dependent side until it disappears. Um, right. Great, yeah. Yeah, great. And I would do another view where I would yeah. take it so to the patient's right side. a transverse right view where yeah, you rotate good. the probe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then right. you've got a much more horizontal view of yeah, the diaphragm. Great. And then and some of this artifact I would get rid of if I shaved uh, if yes. I clip the animal, right? I yeah. have this little bit of air yeah. trapping it, in the fur. There's a, wow. bit of, there's a bit of a contact um, yeah. issue. But um, if you fan uh, a little bit more cranially, so you have your um, probe a little bit flatter along along the dog's abdomen. Mm -hmm. like yeah, that. there we go. Mm -hmm. Then we've got a better view of the, yeah. the gallbladder. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Thanks so much, yeah. Max. You're great. Yeah. You're a champ. He's a good dog. <laughs> Didn't even need any sedation.
Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, we're just to round it out. Thanks so much, Camilla. You know, um, just want to round out, you know, what we kind of reviewed here, five ways that ultrasound can really help your veterinary practice. Uh, you know, in-house access to ultrasound. We heard from the people who already have ultrasound that it speeds diagnosis. And you can see, you know, what, like you commented on a case of um, catching a splenic torsion, right? Absolutely. You act that day, right? And that yeah. is going to result in rapid patient treatment. I can imagine sending the dog out for, you know, the outpatient ultrasound. I don't think that's going to end well if no. you can't diagnose it and fix it right there, right? Exactly, exactly. With, you know, with a splenic torsion, you often, all you know is this dog is, in a lot of pain and and it's coming from the abdomen somewhere so being able to put a probe on is yeah. really useful um and it probably needs to come out asap i would yeah. imagine yeah um, you saw we saw how the app based ultrasound is really straightforward you know we all know how to use our smartphones and touching with the calipers and i want to just marvel at you know you're in the uk i'm here in vancouver british columbia you know we're thousands of kilometers away. you just talked me through through the magic of technology, how to do a gallbladder scan on a dog for my first time, where all I did was I watched one video ahead of time. Yeah, I have scanned a lot of humans, but still, you know, it, it's kind of amazing. And, yeah. you know, in the Clarius, being able to do it even just through the app um, with Clarius Live is another feature where like, this teleradiology idea is really explosive uh, with these new technologies. It's kind of mind blowing. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's definitely something that the Clarius is capable of now, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, where, and, whereas a lot uh, have of you machines, it's hard to set up. <laughs> right, yeah, with a cart. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then lastly, have you experienced the word of mouth, you know, improved referrals and client satisfaction and, and notice any improved revenues in your in your clinical practice? Yeah, definitely. I think that um, a lot of my, um, my practices that I scan for, the clients like that they don't have to travel um, to see us. A specialist you know I can I can deal with a lot of things in in the house for them and then also uh, they don't lose uh, revenue because uh, clients are being moved on to specialist centers and doing a surgery which they could have done in-house so um, yeah it's win-win for clients and for um, right. and and for vet practices being able to do ultrasound in-house yeah well that's great uh you know, I, before I hand it over to Janez, I just, I love this job because I get to meet uh, ultrasound practitioners across the walks of clinical practice, both in human medicine and now veterinary medicine. And, you know, really these uh, handheld probes are revolutionizing practice and really democratizing uh, patient and clinical imaging. It's, it's pretty amazing. And, and the more hands it goes into, the more skills there are, we're really changing the scope of practice. And it's, it's amazing to be a part of that. So thanks so much for participating. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Janez here. We have time for Q&A, I hope. Uh, stay tuned, there are a lot of you here, so we wanna try and get to it, but I'm gonna let Janez take it home and then we'll uh, get to as many questions as we can. So please use the Q&A on the bottom. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Frankel. That was a fabulous scanning with Max. Um, and thank you, Dr. Edwards, for sharing all your beautiful ultrasound techniques and beautiful clinical images. Um, just before we start a live Q&A with our great doctors, I'd like to take a minute to introduce you all to Clarius HD Vet for the highest definition wireless ultrasound to speed diagnosis for small, medium, and large animals. Our C7 Microconvex Vet Scanner is specifically designed for clear clinical imaging for small and medial animals like cats and dogs like you saw today. We also have the C3 Convex Vet for large animals and the L7 Linear Vet for equine. Our family of VET scanners delivers several advantages. Claris is unrivaled for high resolution imaging and handheld ultrasound with dedicated animal presets. It shows you the fine details you need to quickly investigate an area of concern and make a confident diagnosis on a patient's first visit to expedite the right treatment plan. Each scanner is designed with eight beam formers that deliver the image quality and speed only found in traditional systems, but at a fraction of the cost. Artificial intelligence replaces complex knobs and buttons, making our scanners fast and easy to learn and use. Claris is also wireless with zero footprint for high portability to scan animals wherever they are. You get free movement with no wires getting in the way or startling the animals, also making it so much easier to clean and disinfect. Your Claris scanner comes with a free ecosystem with zero subscription fees that includes free apps for your iOS, Android devices, and free updates, unlimited cloud storage to capture and manage your exams, and for unlimited users at no additional cost. Clarius Live delivers one-click telemedicine. If you'd like to share live scanning with a colleague, 
or you would like to have a second opinion. With increased ultrasound billings, you'll see a rapid return on your Claris HD VET scanner, which is ultra affordable. Now, just a quick poll. So before we, we turn to our live Q&A session with Dr. Edward uh, and Dr. Frankel, we have a question for you to ensure that you have the opportunity to learn more about Clarius um, if you'd like to learn more and uh, we piqued your curiosity today. So go ahead and select any of these options that are, uh, that are available to you here today. You can request a quote and pricing as pricing differs by geography. So please go ahead and select that one if you'd like us to send you pricing information so you can find out just how affordable a clear scanner is for your practice. Um, if you'd like to speak to one of our experts, you can go ahead and select that option. You can book a Clarius demo to see what live scanning is. Um, in action uh, with Zoom. We are limited with frame rates of the speed of Zoom, but you can see with a live one-on-one -on -one demo, you'll be able to see the, those fast frame rates. Um, or if you've got a current laptop system and you're really looking to add wireless capability to your practice and you'd like to discuss different features and options, go ahead and select the last option. We'll be happy to follow up with you. Um, and then we've got three video tutorials that we put together. We've just launched in the past week, the new Claris Classroom, which features videos um, by fabulous doctors like uh, Dr. Camilla Edwards. Um, and so we can send you the three videos that we've just added to Claris Classroom today um, uh, in coordination with this webinar. I'm gonna give you five more seconds to select your options here. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm gonna go ahead and, oh my goodness, so many people voting. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll. Um, so now, Without further ado, please do use the Q&A function. Um, if you touch your screen and just scroll to the bottom, you'll see a Q&A box to ask your questions for Dr. Frankel and um, as well for Dr. Edwards. Um, I do want to let everyone know, because we've had quite a few questions about that. Uh, I do want to let you know that in the coming days, you will receive an email with a link to the recording for today's webinar, as well as to a PDF of the slides. Um, so that will be made available to you in the coming days. So now on to your questions. So Dr. Um, Edwards, I'm, there's one that's come up a few times here. I'll just jump in. Uh, of differentiating liver from spleen. How do you know that you're looking at one or the other? Uh, and how, or how do you know it's not a, just a big liver you're seeing? So that's that's a good question. Um, so uh, th th this is where we really need to know our anatomy um, to start with. Um, uh, so we, we need to know where the liver is and where the spleen is. But obviously they're very close to each other. So there is a point where they, they are very close. Uh, the spleen is hyperechoic, so brighter than the liver um, we'd, we'd normally expect. And in the liver, um, there's, there's a bit more going on. So it's, it's got a bit of a stronger echo texture. We've got the portal veins, which have got very bright white walls. And we've got the hepatic veins, which are anechoic tubes, um, which are, are spread sort of diffusely through the liver. So there's a lot more going on there, where, whereas the spleen is much more homogenous. We just have the vessels going in. Um, at the hillus and, and extending just a little way and then we can't really see them in the periphery so so those are the ways that we see the the difference between the spleen and the liver. Great, great. Uh, another question that's come up multiple times is uh, do you believe or do you scan in lateral recumbency versus dorsal do you also do dorsal recumbency too uh, there seems to be some debate in the chat yeah so I don't hear about this. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I've I've tried both, um, but um, yeah, I was I was taught in in lateral recumbency, and I, I think it's one of those things that once you're taught one way, then you end up doing it that way. Um, sometimes I do move the animal around um, to 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 get a better view on something, but um, I do like lateral because uh, we and certainly in general practice we don't always want to sedate the animal. Um, and I, I often find when they're in dorsal, they're going to be in dorsal for, for a, an hour or so while you do an abdominal scan. They're not necessarily going to be comfortable um, or willing to lie like that. Whereas in lateral, they'll often uh, be mo more cooperative um, without sedation if you've got them in lateral recumbency. Right. What, what kind of sedation do you use? That's another question that came up a couple of times. Oh, uh, so it, it, <laughs> it does depend on, on the animal's condition. Um, it, it, it's, it's like anything in general practice. We often like to stick as well to 
um, obviously what's appropriate for the animal's condition, because if we're looking at an, an emergency case, we, we're worry, worrying about um, hypervolemia and, and, and blood pressure and cardiac output. Whereas if we've got a stable animal, it's a totally different scenario. Um, but um, we also need to work with the drugs that we're familiar with because then we're less likely to make mistakes. Um, so yeah, as I, I often use um, metatomidine and butorphanol, um, and but that but that I can vary that if if need be, and sometimes even the animal needs to be um, uh, scanned under general anaesthetic um, because it might be in too much pain um, for us to even be able to uh, scan it sedated. Uh, another question that's come up a couple times is, are you using the same probe to look in the pleural space and maybe for pericardial effusions as well? Um, yeah, I, I often use microconvex probes can, can certainly um, do that. Um, yeah, if we're, if we're looking uh, at TFAST and vet blue scans, uh, microconvex probe is, is definitely adequate for doing that. Um, it's when we want to get into detailed heart scans that we might look at other probes like phased array. Um, but, but yes, a microconvex is great for, for looking in the plural space. Great. Oh, what is the halo sign? I noticed you mentioned it before. Uh, yeah. Can you say a little bit more about what it is? So um, it, we can see a halo sign. So where there's edema around the gallbladder. So we get sort of a hypoechoic ring around the gallbladder. Um, and that can be seen um, with hypoproteinemia, uh, with right-sided ha heart failure, um, and with anaphylaxis, so, uh, as well as cholecystitis. So uh, anaphylaxis is, is one of those things, if we're not, <laughs> not sure what's going on with the animal, we can stick the probe on the gallbladder and it might give us an answer. Um, um, it's a little bit of a quirky thing and I'm not sure uh, why it happens, but it does. <laughs> It does. And, and this is sort of related to human world. And I know my answer, but I'm curious to hear yours about uh, it. When you do see sludge in the gallbladder in dogs, um, how do you know if, if they need treatment or not? How do you det yeah. determine that? So you have to weigh everything up. Um, and it's, it's not as simple as um, we see sludge, we treat. Um, unfortunately, it'd be great if it was that simple, but we sort of have to weigh up uh, what are the symptoms in the, this dog? Would, does that correspond? Are we seeing vomiting? Are we maybe seeing a, a raised total bilirubin? Um, so are the bloods reflecting that there might be uh, cholecystitis? Um, so we need to add in all these factors um, to, to before we consider treatment. So it's not as simple as um, there's sludge in this gallbladder, even if there's a lot of sludge in this gallbladder, that can still be normal in some elderly dogs. All right, I think we're at, um, I'm sorry, we can't get to all the questions. There's just, there's just too many, but we'll definitely get back to all of you by email, whoever uh, put in a question. I think the last one I can squeeze in is, can you scan rabbits? Rabbits? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you can scan rabbits. The problem with uh, rabbit abdomens is that, um, they have a lot of gas in their guts. So it, it is very restricted what you can actually <laughs> see. <laughs> spleens, I think the specific question was spleens in rabbits. Oh, spleens. If you know the rabbits. answer, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I haven't scanned that many rabbits, but yeah, you, you can, yeah. <laughs> okay. Great, well, thank you so much, everyone for your time and your busy days, end of day and beginning of day. Janez, you wanna take us home? And close yes, out? yes, absolutely. Uh, we've now reached the top of the hour. If we didn't get to your question, we will follow up by email in the coming week, possibly weeks, because we do have dozens and dozens of questions. We do promise to get back to you. Again, you will all receive a copy of uh, the PowerPoint slides from today's presentation and a recording as well. So look for an email from us in your inbox uh, in the coming days. Um, I'd like to conclude by thanking the star of our show, Dr. Camilla Edwards. Thank you so much for all the beautiful techniques and images you shared with us today. And also to thank our furry supporting characters, Pippi and Max, um, who were absolute rock stars for today's yeah. event. Um, thank you all. Thank you to all of you, of course, for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you again on March 31st for our next webinar with Dr. Soren. See you all again very, very soon. Thank you. <laughs>